actually quite excited to talk about this topic. I don't, I don't get a lot of opportunities to like kind of craft a topic on my own. It's usually you're, you're given a very specific topic and they're like talk to these points. So um, I'm, I'm just really excited to, to talk about this. And um, despite the fact that I would consider myself a very decisive person, I really struggled to come up with a topic for today. Um, and when Emily asked me to give me this talk, I was like, oh, you know, what, what do people like to hear about? You know, what kind of topics? And she said, people like to hear about, you know, journeys and your life and, you know, overcoming challenges and things like that. And so I asked people, I said, you know, what should I, what story should I tell for this event? And they all kind of came back to this one story that I frequently tell when people ask about in, events in my life that have impacted who I am. And, who have you know, really helped um, shape this movement that I've made from, uh, I actually used to be a molecular geneticist, um, and now I make video games. Um, and so this talk is a little bit about that story, um, and a lot of it about um, you know, how I came to be what I would consider a, a decisive person. And um, the reason that I think that that's important is because Making effective decisions and being a confident decision maker is something that people frequently point out in notable leaders. And not, I'm not saying that I am a leader, but it's something that I want to be in the future. And um, that, that confident decision making is often what people point out. That's the reason that they're good leaders. They're willing to make the decisions that a lot of people often struggle to make. And Leaders are rewarded for being decisive, right? That's how they kind of make their way to the top. But for a lot of people in, in C-suites, they'd say, oh, I'm a very decisive person, and that helps in my leadership. And do they always make the right decision? Absolutely not. But it's the fact that they made the decision at all that is notable. Because so many people focus so much on trying to make the right decision that they don't make any decision. And the funny thing is, is that we spend almost every moment of every day making decisions, right? I mean, everything that you do, even the choice to be here today, the choice to listen to me now instead of being on your phone, right? All of that, those are decisions. And, you know, whether it's deciding what we have for breakfast, where we live, you know, whether or not we have children, the same processes go into making those decisions. And Ruth Chang is a, a woman who said that um, the thing that defines decisions is how the alternatives are placed, right? If the, you have two alternatives and one of them is clearly better than the other, the choice is an easy one, right? But if you have two alternatives with varying, um, you know, pros and cons between them, neither of them is inherently better than the other, the decision is really difficult, right? And one of the things that makes hard choices hard is uncertainty, right? If we had some kind of crystal ball where we could look into the future and see the effect of our decisions, it would be clear which one was better than the other and the choice would be easy. But like many people, we don't know, and so we choose the option that is safest, right? Or the option that is the easiest. And if you think about it, this really makes a lot of sense. Oops, I forgot to skip through these. I forgot you weren't seeing what was on this one. Um, this really makes a lot of sense because we're rational beings that have spent millennia focused on survival, right? This strategy of focusing on the easy option or the option that is the safest makes a lot of sense. But if you think about it, it's kind of silly because all of, all of the evolution that has led to this moment right now isn't necessarily just defined by our ability to survive. It's really our survival as a product of being able to adapt to change and being able to make decisions. Our, our very evolution is defined by our adaptability. So why is it that so often, even when we're making quite small decisions, you know, we struggle to make a choice, even though in our, ingrained in our very DNA is this ability um, and this advantage of making a choice. And I think uncertainty, and it's that fear of making a choice that really frames how we think about ideas of consequences and reward. And we let these systems of consequences and reward push us towards that safe option. 
But part of it is also trusting your own experience, right? Trusting your own instincts. And I don't necessarily mean like relying on your gut, right? I don't mean, um, you know, trusting your gut instinct. I mean things like if I were to throw a ball, you would know generally where to stand to catch it, right? You don't have to be an expert baseball player. The fact that I used a baseball reference being an American, the irony's not lost on me. But <laughs> you, would, you don't have to be an expert baseball player. You don't have to be able to calculate the trajectory of that ball to know where you need to stand, right? You watch the ball's movement and you just generally kind of figure out where you need to be. And it's because you're using your experience in the past as a guide to make that decision of where to stand. And it's interesting to think about where people draw the line between when they're willing to trust their intuition and when they're not. Like, some people are real confident in their ability to assemble IKEA furniture without instructions. <laughs> and my partner definitely doesn't need to use the GPS to get to Lucy's house because we went there one time like four years ago. And every single day, children are born to parents who have absolutely zero experience raising children. But they figure it out, right? And that People are confident in their ability to make that work, even though that's such a huge life decision. But things like what to watch on Netflix or where to go for dinner can often be quite paralyzing. <coughs> and for some reason, these very same people who are happy to make the decision to have children with no experience are the same people who you know, don't move to the city that they've always wanted to live in because you know, how am I going to figure out the traffic? Or how am I going to figure out the subway? Or I'm not going to start a new business because what if it doesn't work out, right? And it's interesting to think about the reasons behind why we let that indecision paralyze us. And that the answer to that is frequently because the way that we think about decisions is framed often by what we choose to focus on in that decision. Because what you choose to focus on creates that emotional connection to the decision-making process, right? If you want to start a new hobby, but you only focus on the fact that you don't have mastery, you might never pick up that hobby, right? If you want to ask your boss for a raise, but only all you focus on is that they might say no, you might never ask. Or you might not think about what kind of rationale would convince them not to say no. Because you're only focusing on the negative there. If you look at a job description for your dream job, and you say, well, I don't have all the skill sets in here, and you, so you might not even apply, right? And even though if you did apply, and you got to the interview stage, and you, know, you absolutely killed it because they love you and you got the job, if you never make the choice to apply because you only focus on what you didn't have, you're never going to get the job, right? You never give yourself the opportunity to figure it out. And the reality is, is that even if you didn't have those skills, right, even if you got the job and you didn't have some of the skills, like, you would figure it out because everybody is innately capable of doing that. And the reason for that is because we rely on our experience and our intuition to figure it out. Like the example with the ball and like the example with the children, you're relying on your, on your experience and applying what you already know to a situation that you don't know how to, you know, you're, you're not an expert in that field, but you figure it out. And, and I have learned very much from this experience firsthand. So in 2018, my partner Jason and I decided that we would leave our very well-paying jobs in DC, sell all of our crap, and drive across the states and visit all of the US national parks. And that landed us in Glacier Bay, Alaska, on a five-day backcountry kayaking trip. And we'd been doing some backcountry trekking on this road trip, so I was like, oh, you know, we'll figure it out. You know, it, you know how hard could it be? And Glacier Bay is exactly what it sounds like. You know, the water is a real balmy four-degree sea, and the air is 10, even in the height of summer. And my entire experience in kayaking was like maybe one or two times with my parents like 10 years before this. But I was like, oh, it, you know, surely it can't be that bad. So, 
you get on this real nice day boat, and it, you know, they take you to the glaciers, and they talk about all the facts, and then they kind of unceremoniously dump you on this beach, and they say, in five days, we'll be back to get you. And you're like, oh, okay, so that's, you know, now we're serious, right? Now I'm 40 kilometers from the nearest human, and I just kind of have to figure it out, which for four days was totally fine. Right? We you know, paddled in around all the little icebergs, we watched the seals playing, we went up to the glaciers and watched them calve, and, and it was all you know, Instagram beautiful. Um, and then on the last day, we are sitting on the beach, and I yell out into the water, hey bear, because they tell you that the worst thing that you can do in Alaska is startle a bear. A startled bear is very, very dangerous. So they tell you just make a lot of noise, so the bear knows that you're coming. If they can hear you approach, they'll naturally just kind of wander away. So I yelled out into the water, hey bear, and my partner Jason's next to me, and he does like a cursory glance around, and then he whispers to me very quietly, there's a bear right there. <laughs> and in my head I was like, surely not. Like, he's joking, it's not funny, but he's joking. And I look over my shoulder, and sure enough, there is a coastal grizzly bear about 10 meters from where we're sitting. And even now when I think about it, like I'll never forget, it's cold, right? So the air, that of the bear just looking at you. And you're sitting there thinking, how did I not hear you come up? <laughs> right? Like you are the size of a car, and I did not hear you get anywhere near me. And the thing about coastal grizzly bears is they're like 20 to 30 percent bigger than regular bears because they eat all that salmon. And I'm 40 kilometers from the nearest human, so my first thought is, Ugh, if Yogi Bear over here decides that we're lunch, nobody's ever going to find us, and my mom is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, I also remembered that on the stupid boat, they made us watch this video that they said, you know, bears in Alaska, because people are so like sparsely populated, they're still afraid of humans. And if you make a lot of noise and you, you know, look big, they'll, they should go away. And so in that moment, you know, we pick up Jay pulls out the bear spray and he puts it next to him, and he starts banging on the pots and, and yelling. And at first I'm like so scared that the yelling, it's, it's not words, it's like blah, 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 like just trying to like get out any sound to try to scare this bear away. And then the adrenaline kicks in and I start like lobbing insults, like cursing up a storm <laughs> and waving my arms to try to get this bear to go away. And I'm thinking to myself, like, this is it, right? This is the moment where I, I thought that I would figure it out, right? I thought, what could be, what is the worst that could happen? And well, here we are, right? This bear's gonna eat me, my mom's gonna be furious, and nobody's ever gonna know what happened to us out here in the Alaskan wilderness. Like, this is it. But slowly, very slowly and surely, the bear like kind of turned around, watched us for a second, and like slowly like ambled away. And that moment became really defining for me because that's the thing. Every time you make a decision, no matter how big or how small, you always think like, what is the worst case scenario, right? And I got there, right? I got to that point that I'm in that worst case scenario, and and I figured it out. Right? I remembered the video, so it wasn't luck. Right? It's not just that I lucked into that situation. I remembered the video, and I had you know, enough courage to remember, don't run, because that turns on the, the prey response of the bear. But I figured it out, and I think that would come to be a defining moment, because I will so often reflect back on that and say, just you know, it, like my role as chair, for instance, before I came to New Zealand, I had zero experience of video games. I somehow convinced my boss to hire me as a project manager, even though I'd only worked in medical device product development. I have three degrees that I don't use. And 
I knew that I would figure it out, right? I knew that there was so much life experience that I had that would be applicable to that situation. I just had to find an opportunity to apply it. And that's because of this universal truth, right? Is that you will be rewarded for being decisive, right? Even if you make the wrong decision, it's still better than making no decision because you will learn from that experience, right? All of the, the micro decisions that I've made that have led to this moment are the result of constantly being rewarded for being decisive. And the great thing about this truth is that it's kind of self-fulfilling, right? Even if you start really small, right? Say I'm gonna make a healthier decision for breakfast instead of eating the donut. Every decision that you make, you will be rewarded and that makes the next one that much easier. So you don't have to come face to face with the bear to be like, oh, look, I can, I can do, I can believe in myself to be able to work through this, right? The more decisions that you make, even if they are wrong, ultimately you will have a net positive. And that's because every decision we make is a product of all hundreds of smaller micro decisions. And the example is, you know, if that dream job, if you never apply, right, then you're never gonna get the job. But actually getting to the dream job is a bunch of micro decisions, right? You have to decide to look for the job. Then you have to decide to apply for it. Then you have to decide to go interview for it. And then of course, because you're fabulous, you're gonna get it, you have to decide whether or not you're gonna take it. But so many people focus on that. That thing that you choose to focus on is all of the consequences of that end decision, not just the first step and then say, I have the opportunity to reevaluate. If I decide that I no longer want this thing, I, I don't lose anything, right? You always have the opportunity to reflect on that decision and decide if you want to keep going. And again, even if you make the wrong decision, let's say you're me, I moved to New Zealand for a job as a scientific writer. I moved all the way across the world and it turned out to be the worst job that I've ever done in my entire life. I actually, uh, on one of my last days in that job, the boss said to me, I took a real risk hiring a woman for this role. <gasps> to my face. <clears throat> but if he hadn't said that, right, if he hadn't insulted me like that, I never would have quit, right? I never would have looked for the job in games, seen the opening, and, remem and realized, like, this is the opportunity to get in the industry that I have always wanted to be in. So even though I was halfway across the world in a job that was horrible, I was still rewarded in the end, right? I still ended up in the job that I wanted from the beginning, that I always wanted. And it wouldn't, if I had never made any of those kind of micro decisions, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to capitalize on, on finding my dream job. And ultimately in the end, I think that the reason that, that works is because you you choose what to focus on, you know, acknowledging where the opportunities for failure exist, and choosing to focus on what you can control, right? So choose to focus on that first step, right? If it's the new job, just focus on applying, right? Focus on building your resume. And because you made that choice, right, you're gonna be more confident about applying for the job that you want. Rely on your experience and your intuition and your resources to figure it out, right? Say yes, just say yes to making the decision at all and you will work it out, right? Now that's not to say that you guys should go jump in the cockpit of a plane and be like, I'm gonna figure it out, <laughs> right? Like things that require skill and very specialized skill, obviously that doesn't apply. But when it comes to giving yourself the opportunity to have new experiences through a new job, a new business, a new partner, whatever it is. Trust your ability to work it out. Give yourself the opportunity to have success because you will be rewarded for being decisive on that point, right? Even if it doesn't work out, you will be rewarded from the experience that you gained and that will contribute to your ability to make it another decision. Focus on small decisions, especially ones of low consequence, and that will make future decisions much easier. And hopefully you don't have to confront any bears to get that. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. That was awesome. Um, that was a huge undertone of bravery.
and they, they underpin that from the bear to actually just starting and making small decisions. Um, for people that may be in, like, indecisive in the position of this isn't good, I'm not sure what next is, right? Yeah. So, um, so yes, that decision's there, but what direction? What would you recommend? I, I think one of the things that has always helped me, especially when it comes to those hard decisions where they have pros and cons and there's not one decision that is inherently better than the other, I typically follow two kind of main tools. One is always feel free to delegate a decision, right? So if you're in a restaurant and you don't know what to eat, you can ask somebody to provide a recommendation, right? 50, you'll make 50% more decisions if you are willing to delegate them, but don't always rely on that decision to, to be the one that you go with, right? That gives you context to help you make your decision, but it doesn't have to be the one that you follow. And the other thing that I always try to do is, I think that the way that we think about hard decisions inherently pushes us to make the safe choice because we always think about the reasons for those decisions, right? So, you know, all of the <coughs> consequences of the decision. For instance, if you're looking between two jobs, Right, let's say that you might want to be a, you know, an artist or you might want to be a banker, right? And you're like, oh, I don't know which one to pick. You know, one makes more money and this one is more on my passion and there are pros and cons to each. And a lot of times if you ask people this question, you say, if I, let's say the banker job pays you twice as much money, right? Would you take it? And people are like, oh, you know, maybe not. Maybe money isn't the thing that would make me decide. Well, if that's the case, then those jobs inherently aren't equal, right? They weren't equal from the beginning. Because if you have two things that are the same and you add to one of them, that should make it easier, right? But if it doesn't, the reality is, is that the reasons that we are giving to that thing, those are all external, right? The, the money, the passion, all of those things. And I think that the, the thing that helps me make those decisions is to think about how, do, how does this decision reflect who I am? Do I want to be the person that is a banker? Or do I want to be the person that is an artist? Because all of those other things, like where you live and the money that you make and the commute, and these are just external reasons that the world applies to our decisions that artificially push us in one direction or the other. But if you really use your own agency as an opportunity to frame your decisions as a, as a piece of who you are, then those other decisions those harder decisions become a lot easier, right? It's not just a, Venn, a, a Venn, 2D Venn diagram where things overlap or they don't, right? It's two decisions that exist in their own completely different space, and I'm, I'm in between them and I can choose to go one way or the other. Neither is a sacrifice, right? It's how do I use my own agency to make that decision to find who I am? Well, thank you. It's slightly different because of both two people. A team, like, oh, I've got a team, oh, I am part of a team, so it's peers. Mm -hmm. We try to decide on this technology or that technology. And we're stuck in a, I don't know, indecision. Um, and, you know, different people have different opinions, but we're all peers. We don't we have the same experience, just different. Yeah. And, the reasons we don't have a manager to delegate that decision to. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say for those, I always find what are, the, what are the opportunities that you can compromise on? Like, what is the thing that you all agree upon? And how can you make that thing the first step in your decision? So, like, let's say it's like this technology choice and everyone has a different option. Is there a way? where, like let's say the cost, right, is the thing that you all agree upon. Is there a way that you can choose one of the decisions as maybe a short-term lease option? And if you don't like it, you can return it. Or, you know, is there a way that you can, um, you know, split that technology choice over time? You know, maybe you try one choice for a period of time and then maybe you switch to another. But if none of that is true, you just have to, you have to find one and you can, and you have to commit, right? You have to, be like, listen, this is the one that has the most things that we agree upon, but let's all agree that this is not a permanent decision, right? Even though that can feel that way, right? You, decisions can feel very finite because you feel like once you have made it, all of the stuff that led to that moment is complete, right? But I think oftentimes it's important to remember that you can always go back, 
right? You can always say, listen, this didn't work out. We made the wrong decision. Let's learn from it. We'll go back and use what we've learned and apply it to choosing a different technology choice. Sorry, I was just going to say that, that one there, the other thing, the, what are your criteria that you're making your assessment against, you know, particularly if it's those kind of choices. I, I love what you said about micro decisions leading to the big ones, you know, how they are small decisions that lead you down that path or the journey. But for some of these ones like that, for example, you could you know, have it a brief set of criteria that we then assess against, and then you go and choose something completely different that's to how it works. But, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and focusing on your goal, right? How do making sure that you have a really clear idea of what your goal is can sometimes help to eliminate some of those, you know, possible choices. Um, especially if um, the choices, the various choices, compromise on that goal. So, for instance, it might be that your goal is to have, you know, I want to be able to stream 4K videos, and they might all of these other cameras might have lots of other features, but at the end of the day. The ability to stream 4K videos is, is the thing that I should focus on because that's ultimately my goal. And all of these other things that contribute to, to you know, your choice, those are mostly just distractions or bonuses. Um, focusing on what your goal is and having those clear criteria can often make that decision easier. <clears throat> How the technology is really similar? Um, yeah, so some of it is just this language versus that language, but, um, but some of it's from this vendor or this vendor. Um, it's a bit of a stack, so yeah. hopefully it means that we can decide on one layer of the stack and then figure out the next yeah. layer. Yeah, um, absolutely. So. Yeah, and again, like if you can break it down into smaller decisions and say, hey, let's, let's do like, um, we frequently are trying to decide between different technologies because we're not sure how they're going to work. And we don't really have an opportunity to figure out how they're going to work until we commit to one. So it's kind of like going to the vendor and saying, hey, can we get like a temporary license? Or can you have somebody come in here and do like a three-day workshop that teaches me how to use this so that I know if it's going to work for us? And sometimes that can help you get past that first kind of feasibility stage. And that can illuminate some of the, you know, the questions and um, you know, to help you frame your goals. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. You know, clearly I made the decision to come today. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really in, I'm really interested because you know, Darcy's challenge or question is really around a technical work decision. And I heard about your, you, know, you, you mentioned about people choosing a job and also asking the question, how does this decision reflect me? Mm -hmm. um, I, leadership and career coaching mm -hmm. and one thing that I observed is the concept you use the word agency or self-belief and my wondering is in your particular yeah do you see a